In fact, you think about a computer program and you're typing up a computer program, if you add a mistake into the program, it wrecks it, it doesn't create some new structure and some new feature. That's what we find mutations do, they, they're wrecking things. In fact, there are over 500,000 mutations identified that cause human disease. And mutations are killing us, they're not creating us. And this is a fundamental problem. Mutations are essential for evolution. They're the only means of producing the new features that are required by evolution to change microbes into microbiologists. But are mutations really up for the job? I'm here today with Dr. Don Batten, who has a doctorate in plant biology, and so he's well qualified to help us dive into the technical aspects of this big question. So Don, firstly, what are mutations? Well, mutations are accidental changes in the DNA. So when we have children, we pass on our DNA to our children, mistakes are made, some mistakes are made in copying that information. Those mistakes are called mutations. So it's a bit like if you're typing on your computer and you hit the wrong key, mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to copy some text and you hit the wrong key, that's a typo. Well, mutations are like typos in our DNA. Okay. So, and the, like with the typo, you can delete a letter, leave a letter out, you can change a letter, you can add a letter. Yep. Mutations are like that. They can delete, they can add, they can substitute, uh, but that's what they are, accidental changes. Okay. So what do mutations have to do to make evolution work? Well, if you're going to change a worm into a fish, mm -hmm. you have to add the instructions in the DNA to specify how to make features that fish have that microbes don't have or that worms don't have. Yep. So a fish has gills, it has eyes, it has uh, all sorts of features that are absent in the worm. Mm. So how do you get the instructions to make all those extra features? That's what mutations have to explain. So if you think about changing a microbe into a microbiologist, the simplest microbe that can live, we're talking about the DNA information would occupy a book the size of the Bible. That's a lot of pages. That's a lot of pages of information. Yeah. So to change it into a human though, a human has a thousand sized uh, books, of, a, a, a thousand Bible sized books of information. Mm. So you have to add 999 books of new information which specify how to make all the features we have that microbes don't have. When you think about, you know, our eyes and muscles and bones and circ circulatory system and nerves mm. and all sorts of brain, so much has to be added instructions to make all those extra features. Mm. So what's the problem? Can mutations do that? Well, accidental changes can't create uh, that sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, so that's the problem. Uh, evolution dead in the water because accidental changes can't create the information needed to specify all those new features. It's the nature of what they have to create. So if you think of a new enzyme, it's not just a couple of letters in the DNA, it's hundreds of letters in the correct order. So mutations might be able to change one or two letters, but they're not going to create enough to make a whole new enzyme because that's to be specific order. You think about, and many of the things require multiple proteins, which are hundreds of amino acids in the correct order, mm. specified on the DNA. So for example, a new biological uh, molecular pathway to create some uh, protein, a, a hormone or something, yep. uh, requires multiple enzymes, not just one, and they have to be all present for it to work at all. A lot of the motors we see in living things uh, the things that make our muscles work are linear motors and rotary motors, and these are multiple proteins that have to be the right sequence mm -hmm. to function together and to do what they do. So accidents can't create that sort of thing. So just like the typo you were talking about before, it sounds like mutations are going to wreck things. Correct. In fact, you think about a computer program and you're typing up a computer program, if you add a mistake into the computer program, it wrecks it. It doesn't create some new structure and some new feature. Mm. And that's what we find mutations do. They, they're wrecking things. In fact, there are over 500,000 mutations identified that cause human disease. I was going to say, have you got some evidence for this? That sounds like some evidence. So if you look up the internet, there's a human gene mutation database mm. and it specifies these 500,000 so far found mm. uh, mutations that cause human disease. Wow. 
So they're wrecking us. They're not creating us. Mm. And that's what they're known for, wrecking things. Okay, but evolution so far, we're saying it, it needs mutations for this creative process. How does that work then? <laughs> well, it doesn't. That's the problem. Mm. So sometimes uh, mutations can be helpful, but even when they're helpful, they're still still wrecking things. Mm. Well, I've, I've heard people talk about antibi antibiotic resistance um, and mutations being beneficial in this sense. What are we talking about here? Yeah, well, if a bacterium, disease-causing bacterium is in the presence of the antibiotic and the antibiotic kills it, that's what you want to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, there are many cases where antibiotic resistance has developed because of mutations. But in every case where they've been studied at a molecular level, yep. they find that something's broken. Okay. So, for example, uh, an enzyme can break down the antibiotic and the, normally the bacterium produces a certain amount of the enzyme, mm. but not enough to break down all the antibiotics. So if you have enough of the antibiotic in the dose, it kills yes. the bacterium. But um, the bacterium has a mechanism that determines how much of that enzyme is produced. So it limits the amount to what it needs. So what, you can get a mutation in the control system can result in the bacterium losing control over the production of the enzyme. Mm. So now it's producing heaps and heaps of the enzyme and then it breaks down all the antibiotic and is resistant to the antibiotic. But take it away from the antibiotic and it can't turn off the production of the enzyme. So in the wild, out in the world, away from the hospital, away from the antibiotic, mm. uh, it's less fit to survive. Mm. So you've broken something which helps it survive, so it's helpful, mm -hmm. but you've broken something, you're not created something. Mm. And that seems import an important distinction there. It's still broken something even though there may be something helpful happening. Here. Correct. So, Don, then, are you saying that all mutations are harmful? No. Um, mm. as, a, as we just discussed, there are examples of helpful mutations, but even the helpful mutations are breaking things. So it's a bit like um, the Russians have invaded U U Ukraine. So Ukraine has blown up bridges to stop the tanks from advancing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's helpful to blow up the bridges to stop the tanks advancing. But blowing up the bridges doesn't explain how you make the bridges. Mm. And so okay. the, any, the, the, the mutations blow up bridges, yes. which can be helpful, yeah. but they don't create the bridges. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But in effect here, yeah, evolution is saying they need to. Yes, evolution has to have a mechanism for creating new bridges, not just blowing up the ones that are there. When we're talking about mutations, often people are thinking about cancer, is that relevant? Yeah, very much relevant, yes. Like cancer is caused by mutation. Um, and my own father died with uh, prostate cancer, so sort of a bit close to home. And many of us have been touched by that. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, mutations are killing us. They're not creating us. And this is a fundamental problem. So when mutations were discovered back in the 19, early 1900s, they got quite excited about that, especially when they discovered that radiation can induce mutations because mutations were then thought, well, there's a mechanism for evolution to create new features. So they embarked on a program of breeding of fruit flies after irradiating them. So they irradiated them with gamma rays and Right. Induced mutations. And this is the little ferment flies you get when you leave some fruit out uh, on yep. the bench and mm -hmm. you get the little tiny flies flying around. They're, they're Drosophila mm -hmm. ferment flies and they've been used for laboratory experiments for 100 years. And so they irradiated these flies expecting to make super flies. Mm -hmm. And they did that for many years and they never got anything other than a defective fly. So they got ones without wings and ones without legs and ones with extra antennae and and all sorts of defective flies, but never got super flies. But they genuinely thought they were going to produce. Oh, they some genuinely sort of thought they were going to su supply. They were going to prove evolution, basically, by you know breeding these flies with the irradiation and mutating them and making them into, yeah, demonstrating how evolution progresses. And what do you think led them to think that? the idea of mutations was going to do that? Well, modern genetics had found that the features in living things are based on our genes. And so you need to find a way of getting new genes to create the new features. So this became well known and it became a crisis for evolution. And then they discovered mutations. Oh, this is how they get the new features. And 
because the mutation is a new feature in a sense of a, a, a fruit fly without wings mm. is different, mm-hmm. you know. Yes. But you don't put wings on fruit flies by mutations. You can just take them off. So you mm. destroy the information. You don't create it. And then they progress to things like breeding of crops, so um, wheat and things like that, irradiated wheat and irradiated different flowers and things like that. Thinking that they'd get a different outcome uh, to the flowers? Hoping, hoping for uh, some greatly improved features in okay. the wheat or the flower or whatever. Um, and you do get you get some useful features, like, for example, yep. dwarf crops, tro- crops that are short, don't tend to fall over in the wind. Mm. When, when there's wind and rain, wheat can fall over and then lodge and then you can't harvest it. So short wheat has a benefit for the farmer. Mm-hmm. And you can get short wheat by mutation breeding because you destroy some stuff that, that, that needs to be tall. Yeah. <laughs> so there, and say for example, the color of flowers. So it's because the flowers are determined, the color of the flowers are determined by pigments, and there's yep. various pigments. Yep. If you knock out one of the pigments, you change the color of the flower. Mm. So you can get some interesting horticultural features by mutation breeding. Mm. But in every case, you're breaking something. You're not actually making something. And this is what it was hoped that they'd have a mechanism for making things. Mm. But mutations don't make things. They break things. Mm. And so do you think, Don, that when people hear that a mutation has um, changed something, maybe it's beneficial or it's just different, that you sort of automatically think that that means Oh, evolution's happening. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's not. That people are being misled. Well, probably don't know enough about it to understand that yeah. it's actually a downhill change, mm-hmm. whereas we need serious uphill change to explain evolution. And why do we need this serious uphill change? Well, we go back to our one book of information in the bacterium versus a thousand books in a human. So all those extra books are for all those extra features that we have that they don't have. So there's no mechanism for creating all that new, new specific information for all those features. Mutations just don't cut it. And yet it's hanging on this in a sense. True. There's no other mechanism. Just in case anyone's still in doubt... Don, do you have another example of a beneficial mutation that's actually still breaking down something? Well, the classic one in the textbooks is sickle cell anemia, which um, folk in Africa, if they have this, they tend to be resistant to malaria. So, oh, here's an example of a beneficial mutation. Mm. But anemia is a disease. So sickle cell anemia is a disease. Okay. So it's a disease that actually makes you somewhat resistant to malaria. So if you have one gene which has this mutation on it, you have this sickle cell trait, it's called. But if you, as an athlete, try to run a marathon, you have 37 times the risk of dying of sudden death. So you're resistant to malaria, but if you start running, (laughs) there's a problem. There's a problem. Mm. So would you like that beneficial mutation? Mm. Okay. Um, So under the certain circumstances, Mm. that mutation prevents people getting malaria, but it's actually breaking something. The DNA for hemoglobin has one letter error in it in the wrong spot, and it results in your blood cells being sickle-shaped instead of donut-shaped. And because of your sickle cell shaped blood cells, Mm. malaria doesn't like you. Okay. And that's why why you're somewhat resistant. Mm. But you're still breaking something. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like saying if you're a smoker and you want to avoid gangrene, just chop your legs off. Mm. (laughs) Okay. So it's that sort of thing. It's breaking something which happens to be somewhat helpful under certain circumstances. Mm. Okay. In these textbooks we're talking about, I have to ask, as a high school teacher... Do they mention this perspective on mutations? Do they tell us the truth about how they actually are still breaking things down, not adding information for new features? I don't know of any government-approved high school textbook which acknowledges the limitations of mutations. Why not? In fact, most of them don't even mention mutations. They hardly mention them, maybe in one paragraph. They hardly mention mutations. They concentrate on natural selection. Mm. So natural selection, they show examples of natural selection and there are plenty of examples of natural selection, but they actually avoid talking much about mutations because I think they would realise that students will 
say, hang on a minute, this doesn't add up. How can accidental changes create all these features? Because they're also studying some of the amazing mm. biology in living things in their textbooks, some of the motors and uh, the amazing biochemistry and so on. Mm. And it just doesn't add up that accidents created all this stuff. So they just, I, tend, I think they're just avoiding talking about mutations because, well, the game's up for mutations. They don't work. If they talked about mutations and told students the reality, the students would realise that evolution is dead in the water. All right. So if mutations can't actually make all that new information, where did it come from? Well, the evidence shouts at us that there's a superior, absolutely intelligent creator who created everything. Mm. That's what it's telling us. Uh, you don't get sophisticated programming from accidents, from nature. Chemistry doesn't produce programming. Only intelligence produces programming and living things are full of programs and they have to have a programmer. And the progr only programmer that's possible is God, the creator who's revealed in the Bible. We admit that about all the things we see that, you know, people create today that require such planning and um, ingenuity, but we don't like to admit potentially that we also, the, the earth, the universe, people, that they've been created with a plan and a purpose in mind? Absolutely. And we talked about bridges a while ago. Um, bridges require an engineer mm. to, to design them. They don't just make themselves. Um, you can destroy bridges easily, but you can't create them easily. And the creation of the bridge requires a creator, a, an engineer. And uh, living things are full of things much more sophisticated than bridges. And they demand a supernatural creator. We've established how the textbooks aren't giving us the information about mutations and how they break things. I know that my students in high school have appreciated Evolution's Achilles Heels documentary and how that brings to light some of the information we're talking about. You're actually in it. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so Evolution Achilles Heels, a documentary, there's a number of PhD scientists that are interviewed in the documentary. It's very powerful and it's very suitable for particularly high school, senior high school students, university students. Uh, it deals with mutations, natural selection, and a lot of other things like cosmic evolution, which is the evolution of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very comprehensive, uh, very viewable. Uh, the book's got more detail. So the documentary is available by streaming. So there's a great opportunity to view this documentary we are making it available as a free download for seven days. And the link will be in the description below. Don, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jess.